Hi everybody, good evening. Um, I hope you guys are doing great. So we want to do another of our EU talks. Uh, we have very two important guests tonight. We have Dr. Jose Suarez. He is the Dade County Medical Association President. And we also have Angel E. Bosch de Leon. But <laughs> he's the Managing Director of the Dade County Medical Association. So he's gonna, they're going to be talking, have more like a conversation. And they're going to talk about the situation, what is going on with the medical field for us patients or future patients or ex-patients and whatever the conversation flows. So I'm going to just start with a very generic conversation for, for uh, a question for both of you. So how you see the medical field moving, what's going on with all this the COVID-19, the changes in Medicare, the uh, changes in technology. So. Just give us a little bit of a, of a starting point to us to make sense of all these things. Okay, I, I want to just tell you a little bit about myself before I answer that. I'm a family doctor um, and um, I've been involved in leadership in hospitals, outpatient and clinics uh, throughout my entire career in education, medical education. And um, I did a lot of hospital work and recently, I always felt that our system was very fragile, that, that we had a great system, but a very expensive system. I mean, when you really think about it, some intricate operations to do with robotics, you really want to, you know, do it here. But we really don't, you know, we put a lot of money behind healthcare, but we don't get great quality care all the time. You can go to other countries and get amazing care and our, you know, some people are in other countries are living more than we, than, than we are. But that's a complex issue. COVID brought us to the forefront of how fragile the system is and how the government has made all these rules and we noticed that it actually hurt us so much rules. COVID is bad, was bad. Um, a lot of people died. I saw so many people, patients die. Um, I was in charge of, of taking a hospital and transforming it, and it was like a war zone. I, I really felt like it was war. You know, because whatever decisions we made could cost people's lives. People could die, and that's not a good thing. And I saw a lot of people your age just die. Um, and I had to go, and it's scary, because you know, I had to go into a COVID unit, and I could get COVID. Um, thank God that didn't happen. But um, it, it really brought attention of how we have to change in the system. And it, and it, it increased information technology, it increased communication. Uh, ho uh, the government started funding hospitals because they wanted to reduce hospitals more and more and more. Um, I think it strengthened it in that regards. And I think it was a wake up call for all of us how we really need to be um, aware of this system and take care of the system so the system can take care of us. Um, I think it's an explosion. Um, and, and Angel, you know this. Our, you know, our gross, our gross domestic product, like the, 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 the amount of money, the budget of the United States of America 18% of the entire economy, almost 20%, almost a fifth of the entire budget of America is spent on healthcare, like almost $9 trillion. Um, and it's growing exponentially. We, um, we, we spend the most, but we don't have the exactly. best. Exactly. So we, we don't have the best. We don't, we don't. So, so we, and, and that's the point, that we basically spend so much money, but we don't have the best. Uh, when you look at the when you look at our numbers compared to other uh, uh, countries, overall, like when it comes to specialty training, like if you want to get a gamma knife and you have a brain tumor and you want to get a laser beam right into that tumor, boy, we could do that pretty good. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Really getting people on cholesterol medication and diabetes medication that's kind of hard. And there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of tears in healthcare. Well, we're uh, technology developed, but uh, we don't take care of the people. Right. Uh, we don't believe in prevention, seems right. to me. Right, right, right. And 
at least 25 to 30 people, 30 percent of the people does have access to healthcare. Correct. And that's a big number. So with with this um, intro, that's that's one of the things that we have. You have to always uh, aware that some, a guy like Alex call, call you. Hey, I want to. I want you to talk to, to talk to the, to the guys about these topics, and then all of a sudden he changed everything. So you have to change the presentation in your mind to see how it fits to the ones that you have here, so we can deliver a real message to you. Okay? So it's a complex it's, it's a complex problem, it's a complex situation, but I think, Dr. Suarez, that we have to go through the the baby steps. These guys are in healthcare technology, right? And healthcare management. Mm -hmm. Management or technology? Healthcare management. Management, okay. So, even though, even though uh, I was mentioned that we're, we're going to be talking to healthcare guys, IT guys also. So, we're, we, we're going to, to have the both topics during our presentation. So, let's start for the, in the beginning. What does health mean to you? What is health? So, because people have like, talks about healthcare. So, but what is health? So, health is your social well-being. You, how you are, you know, mm -hmm. medically, your um, your basic health. And it's not, and it's not just like to have a good heart. It's not organ specific, but it's also emotional. You know, psychosocial. Um, health has to do with where you live, the demographics. If you're a man, if you're a woman. Um, you know, if, uh, if you're in a family. So health encompasses all that. And that's why it's a complicated subject, and it's complicated because there's so many factors in health. So what, what does the, these guys that are learning about healthcare management, when that patient comes to the office, when that patient comes to the practice, with pain, with a problem, with a situation, does they only have to, to look for insurance? If they have the money to pay, if he's uh, um, capable of paying the bills, or they have to take care of him first, and then ask if you can pay. So I'm I'm going to tell you my philosophy and what healthcare has two sides. Healthcare is th there's the beauty of taking care of a sick person or maintaining somebody's life and being there for them. You know, the most rewarding moments in my career are like, you know, helping somebody or delivering a baby. Um, as a family doctor, we do all that. Um, and, and the nice thing that you're helping people, like right? all you guys want to help people. But there's an ugly side of it, which becomes the economy of it. You know, the, do you have insurance? Do you not have insurance? Um, unfortunately, that's how our system is, that there are people that don't have insurance and they actually don't seek access to health care, which is sad. Um, and I think that um, that, as a manager, if you guys are going to be in healthcare management um, or leaders in healthcare, that that's a part of it that actually is very difficult to, to, to swallow sometimes. But my philosophy and the way I've always practiced medicine, I always knew that I would always have a patient that didn't have insurance and I would take care of them and you know, whatever they could pay, if they could give 10 bucks or 20 bucks or if they couldn't pay, I, I was okay with it. Um, not everybody's like that. And that's not, that doesn't mean I'm like, you know, gonna save the world because you actually have to put food on your table and you can't just do everything for free. Um, but I believe that if you do the right thing, if you really uh, take care of the patient, if, you, if your focus is the community, the patient, that the economic rewards would be, will be there. But, but, definitely. but, but you can do that if you're a solo practitioner. Well, how about if you're working for a hospital? If you're working for a, a, a practice group? that they have uh, the protocols, that they have the, the guides, that they have uh, ways of doing things, and maybe they are looking only for the revenue and not necessarily for the health 
of the patient. Right. So yeah, that's where that's where it becomes complicated because right now the system in the United States it has become very corporatized. So I was I was always a believer. I advocate for physicians. Not I don't just advocate for physicians, but I also advocate for patients. And I was always resisting the corporatization of medicine, meaning that the big companies get in and they run and manage healthcare. What happened was is that the government set guidelines and government said, okay, this is the way that you're gonna treat the patient and this is what we want and these are the metrics and these are the analytics and this is what you need to do to try to maintain your patients healthy. And that's what's happening now. So right now, the system is going through a transformation of being sort of corporatized, let's call it, where big companies are buying up doctors' practices and hospitals, big hospital systems are buying little hospital systems and they're basically consolidating. And that's what's happening. So a lot of the solo small doctors in their practices it, that's kind of like fading away. If, if health covers these different areas, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually, what does healthcare encompass? Well, healthcare is a, is a system. You know, it's an entire system that has, that has to do with every aspect, aspect of health. So if you look at health, and then you have, you have like information technology, technology where that is a very important role so maybe when you go out and you start working you get into a healthcare like software company that develops artificial intelligence um, to support doctors when it comes to billing uh, or artificial intelligence for example I need to I as I'm the chief medical officer of, a, of an organization and I have, um, I have 72 doctors and um, we, I need to look at, are my doctors checking patients cholesterol? So I need that. Are the patients getting their colonoscopies? Are the patients getting their, uh, their mammograms? So these are analytics. So we look at companies to provide that information, that software to us so then we could look inside, the, we could put that platform inside our our, our system and say 85% of all the patients that you've seen have gotten their mammogram or no you know maybe 50% has only gotten it so that's how the system is being integrated there's medical device companies mm -hmm. there's pharmaceuticals I mean the list goes on and on and on and on there's but, but, but within the, the, the healthcare system and this is uh, part of the law that you were talking uh, earlier about the Medicare, the Medicaid, and how people have access to, to health care. We also have the different areas, the, how the, this, the health care system works in the United States. That in order to get, to get attention from a doctor, you go first to the first level. This is primary care, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Then you go to secondary or acute, and then to share care in, in, in the system. This is, how, this is how Florida works. This is how the world works here, uh, Dr. Dr. Suarez, uh, to provide a great system, healthcare system to the patients. Okay, so, you know, all of us are born, this is a little cheesy, but when you're born with a doctor at your side, right, usually, unless you know, got a midwife or your mom just had you without any physician, and you usually pass away with a doctor at your side, right? So throughout the entire spectrum of your life, you need a doctor. Hopefully you won't need a lawyer, but you're gonna need a doctor. You and always you, are going, is going to a I know, that's not a good thing. <laughs> but hopefully you won't. So throughout the entire trajectory of your life, this is what, what you're basically going to see. You're going to go through the entire system of healthcare. You're going to be born in a hospital with an obstetrician, with nurses, with an entire team. Then you're going to go to your pediatrician, which is primary care. And then if you have to go to the hospital, that's your secondary care. So you're going to go to an acute care setting, which is hospitals. And there's little hospitals 
in little communities, and then there's regional hospitals where they're bigger, and then there's uh, bigger systems, and then the tertiary care is where it comes very, you know, when you're really sick, if you have that tumor or you have that trauma, you go to a trauma center, and those are the different layers of healthcare or, or in the, within the system of health, healthcare. Um, and these are some of the mm -hmm. uh, spectrum that we all go through. This is, this is how the healthcare system works. Do you have any questions at this time before we yeah, get in? Actually, into, I'd like into, to hear a little into, bit about Into the management area. Because you have to understand where you're going to be working. I want to add something that it's been a, a product to me for a lot of years. Because I come from a country where you go to the doctor, you have a back pain, a pain in back, and he presents things. He gives you, uh, he recommends you to take, for example, the Gofenac, and you go to the pharmacy, and you buy it for one dollar, 16 euros. Okay. I got the same problem here in the United States, and went to the doctor, and he recommends me to have the same type of the Glofenac, and went to the pharmacy, and it's $220 for the same 16 pills. You're going to ask a very catchy question. Okay, go ahead. So, <laughs> why is that a huge difference in the health, and what is the health system so expensive? I know that, as you said, every, every doctor has to make a living again, and as, as everybody does. And the health systems and corporatization. But you know the doctor doesn't make any money from a that. A penny. <laughs> Not even they a don't penny. make any money from that pharmaceutical, that prescription that they, that they wrote. So pharmaceutical is a totally different topic in the sense that, and yes, the healthcare system is very expensive. What happens is, let's say, you know, Merck, you know, pharmaceutical company, invents a medication. It takes millions and millions and millions of dollars to bring that medication to market. So what they look at is they say, you know what? Americans could actually pay top dollar for that medication. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna charge Americans for that research and development, but there's other countries that can't afford it. And then, you know, it's less. That's one, one excuse. The other one is, is that there's really a lot of inflation and, and uh, you know these numbers are inflated so they figure that they can pay for it that your insurance company per, could pay for it so it's like a game there's no transparency that's what we're always saying there has to be transparency in the system and it doesn't and isn't it a good business if it was if it wasn't regulated my opinion if healthcare was not so regulated by government it could open up more business opportunities, and it will cheapen the prices of, of things. For example, the, I bet you, you go to GoodRx right now. You go to GoodRx, are you guys ever hear of GoodRx? So it's a little, it's a little app. You go to GoodRx, and that same medication could cost you $7. You go to Publix and you get metformin for free, you get amoxicillin for free, you get Captopril for free at Publix. So you kind of need to know the system, and it's not a fair system. It's not a transparent system. So that poor person that's not savvy doesn't know. You know, I remember I just get, said, I gave a prescription to somebody, and I said, listen, this thing is cheap. Don't worry about it. So I put it at Walgreens, not to talk bad about Walgreens, but... The guy called me up, he goes, oh yeah, that medication's 300 bucks. <laughs> I go, what are you talking about? 300 bucks? He goes, yeah, you said it was cheap. And then I went on GoodRx, same pharmacy, same medication, 30 pills, $7. And it was on GoodRx. I, I, I texted, you know, I, I sent it to him. And it was like, wow, I can't believe it. And then he became a member of Walgreens, and I think he got it for even cheaper. I think he got it for five bucks. So you really need to be a consumer and know the system well, because there's a lot of intricacies in the system. In, in the other hand, there's a lot of people that see health as a business. And there's a lot of people making a lot of money uh, out of that pill here in the United States. They charge for the R&D, 
But every time any company sends something to the FDA, they have to pay 100,000 ones to see if it, if it goes through. Okay? So every time you have to pay. That's the other part of the business. So these guys, these companies, and I'm a, I'm a client, not from GuraX. I buy my pills in Canada. I send my prescription to Canada, and they send me the same pills in the same package for one third of the cost. Mm -hmm. Because outside, they ha outside of the United States, they have a price. Mm -hmm. Because people maybe don't have all the money to afford for the meds. So somebody has to pay for that. And who pay for that? The guys in the United States. Those are the ones that pay that pays the dues for the other guys in out of the United States. Okay? And they see this like a business. Unfortunately, they don't see the pain, the need, they only see the business. And that's what's happened. Sure. And now that we're going to start with the management part, we want to ask you as well. Uh, we know that the, the, the health system in the United States is based on, as you said, pharmaceutics, medical practice, sometimes are based on business. That's correct. Huge hospital complexes are based on business. But the fact is that why is that uh, countries in Europe, for example, can provide education and health for free, a welfare state for their citizens, and we are so uh, having such an unfair system in the United States. Will it be possible for all for the United States to provide to the 350 million people who live in this country a fair, a fair uh, health, health system? That's a topic for three or four more lectures. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but that would, because that would, that, that's going to involve uh, government, uh, government system, how democracy works, how um, the political, dynamic. the political yeah. dynamics works in, <coughs> within each country. For instance, let, let's take the, the, and I know that this is your lecture, but I'm just sharing my, my experience here. Let's take Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is give or take like Miami, but Miami has better roads. Okay. In Puerto Rico, only 6% of the people doesn't have access to healthcare. Okay? Here, the same system, 25, 30% doesn't have access. But what happened in Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico is spending money that they don't have. They depend on the federal government to pay for the health, for the health system in Puerto Rico. So it depends on the priorities of the government. It depends on the challenges that, that you want to face. And it depends on the, on the political uh, environment that you're living with. Singapore. Everybody loves Singapore and, until last week. But what happened last week? That they say, the guys uh, that are not <coughs> vaccinated will not be covered by health insurance. Bring that idea to the United States. They will say that Singapore is the worst place on earth. And my friend, Singapore has a, a, a earning per capita, one of the highest earnings per capita in the world because of the political system. But that, that's another lecture. Go ahead. So uh, uh, just to answer this, because this is really important, and I'm going to tell you exactly, I, I live and breathe healthcare for many years. I believe that every single American and every single citizen of this country could have affordable health care and access to health care. And I think it's easy. Right now, so, so what happens is, is that there's a lot of politics behind it and there's too much government regulation. The government is way too involved. If, if, I, if I would take you into my world and talk to you about HEDA scores, HCCs, HHS, um, CMS, 
all the, all the regulatory all the organizations that are after us, not after us, but regulating us, you'd be like, whoa, what is this? I believe that there's things that, for example, all of you are you know, young, in your 20s, um, maybe some of you in your early 30s, and why isn't it that you can't have something like a health savings plan where you start paying into your, your, your health insurance and it's also a retirement fund and it's also funds for you to use and you can go to any doctor you want and if you don't use it and you stay healthy, you make money off of it. So there's so many creative ways. If you, the, you know what the beauty of business is? Why is it that when you look, I'll give you an example. LASIK, you know LASIK operation for your eyes? Totally unregulated. Totally unregulated. There's no government there. Nothing. Botox, fillers, laser, all those things, not regulated. What happens is LASIK, you can go get LASIK right now for 250 bucks. When LASIK came out, when radial keratotomy started back in the 80s and 90s, it was like $5,000 an eye. Competition and business drove the price down. down. And that's the problem in healthcare. Healthcare is not, is an over-regulated business with too many government and too many peoples with their hands in the pot, and they don't want to get rid of that. So if it was open market, if it, was, if it wasn't regulated, you would have good service. When you go to the doctor, he, they're overwhelmed or their nurse practitioner is overwhelmed. And what happens is, is that the system has burned them out. Why is it that physicians are committing suicide more than any other mm -hmm. group in the United States? Did you know that doctors, like five times more than the regular person on the street will commit suicide because it's, they're getting burnt out because of the system. Mm -hmm. So that's why healthcare is so expensive. And if we were to do that, if we would get government off, and I'm not saying 100%, I think we need rules, we need certain rules, you gotta follow rules, you know, cause then it's, it's crazy. But when you have free market enterprise, then that's a, that becomes a good system. You know, it, it's, it's gonna have some, some growing pains, you need some rules, but that's my personal opinion. Because the other thing is, is that if you want, if government takes over, which actually right now 60 something percent of the entire system is paid by the US government, Medicare, Medicaid, all these programs are, are, are government funded. <clears throat> Canada, if you have a hip, if you have a, 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 a broken hip, you can go weeks without getting it operated on. Month. Months. Month. And so what happens is the government says, we're not going to pay for that. So that's a slippery slope asking the government to take over 100% of the health care of the United States. So they'll just look at it and say, we're going to cut this off. So <clears throat> I, that's why you guys are in the business management. And always remember this if you're in business. A good business gives good, uh, uh, good service because you go out of business if you don't get good service. A good business always, if you run your family like a business, if you run healthcare like a business, you know what? You get good outcome. There has to be rules. I'm not saying that it's just, you know, deregulate everything. But as a business major and in healthcare management, that's what you want. You, that's how. That's when you give great service. One, one of the things that just to, just to interrupt. No, no, so I, imagine if you know you're gonna get your check, and you're gonna get the money anyway. Do you care if you're nice? Do you care what you what you prescribe? Ah, let them resolve it. So that's that's what happens in healthcare. But if you want to make a difference, and, and I know that you go, your thoughts are going that way. You make the difference. You have, then you have to decide whether you want to continue as a manager or you want to become a leader. And there is a difference between a manager and a leader. Can some can share some thoughts about that? What do you think is a manager 
You, you, you cannot participate. <laughs> You're not, no. What is a manager? What is a leader? You're like, oh my God, I'm not gonna. Is that why you went over there? Why, why, why are you not the same? Don't, don't be afraid of the you can, Listen, there's no wrong answer. Just say anything. Yes. Okay. That's a great, that's, it, that's you, a great, you hit I, it out I, of the, you know, fact, you can see the difference? Yeah. So, so you're saying, so you're saying that the president of the United States is a manager or is a leader? <laughs> doesn't, doesn't have to be, I, I'm just asking a question, no colors, no colors. The, because he's, he's supposed to be in charge no, of he's everything. A for me, he's a supposed manager. to inspire people. No, for me, he's a manager. In my case, in my he's, case a he's a manager. He's not a leader. But and, that, and that happened to the, the, the past ones? <laughs> no, no, past ones? <laughs> not, not the last one, the past ones. <laughs> it's a difference, right? It, it, it depends. So, so you, for you, the for president of the United States is not a leader, no. he's a manager. Okay, so go ahead, go ahead so, so, with the difference. So look, let, let, let me tell you this. Uh, like you said, a leader has vision and the managers usually carry out that vision. But to be a leader, you also know, have, have to know how to manage. Mm -hmm. And to manage, you got to be a leader. So I think it's kind of in, intertwined, but you could say these guys are the generals and, and this is like the, the sergeant that gets the work done. Usually managers make it happen. Um, you know, when I, when I started with this company, what I liked about it was like, we want you to be the visionary. We want you to come up with the ideas and we're gonna get all these managers around you to make it happen. I'm like, oh my God, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then the managers want me to do their jobs too. So, but, but it's intertwined. So to be a good manager, you have to have leadership qualities because you want to bring your team. You need to inspire people. You need to motivate people. And that's what a good leader does. And that's what a good manager does. So these are the differences. And sometimes you have to create a path. Sometimes you have to think out of the box and, and to help the managers, to help you. Because this is a team effort. A leader alone is not a leader. It's a guy with good ideas. Leaders need people so, they can, you know, so he can accomplish his vision, okay? I'm going to uh, a good recommendation. I once uh, read a book that is it's called Walk the Talk. It's a great, it's a great book. And that, that, that um, book is going to, to teach you that you can have all the ideas, but you have to inspire people and you have to be the first one to do what you say. It's not from this area to the bottom. It's from here to the bottom, okay? It's like some people that say, what are the values of the, this organization? What are the mission, the vision? And you see, and you see that posted in, in every wall in different companies, right? Do you participate in that? Probably not. It's not your vision are not your values, is somebody, probably a consultant, that copied from a book, and it sounds good for, for, the, for the company, but do you feel it? Uh, those are your values. So if you have an opportunity, read that, it's, it's a very, um, it's not a, a heavy book, it's called Walk the Talk. So now, we're running out of time, but we can, we can continue. This part of technology, technology has grown in, the, in, the, in these years exponentially. Guys like me, the old guys, the baby boomers, right? We're baby boomers, right? 
the boomers, um, we use a telephone with, with you have to dial. We usually use a, a phone that it was in the, a pay phone that it was in the street. But now you have your cell phone, you have everything. So technology have grown and it's in, and, and it have um, affected healthcare in every ways. Let's talk about the different uh, uh, situations where technology <coughs> is affecting, and, and with the COVID, in, 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 the, in the sense of the telemedicine. Right. That so I just want to get an idea of you guys. So when, I, I hate saying it like this, but when you grow up, what do you want to, like, what is your goal? Not when you grow up, but when you graduate. <laughs> What, what is it that you want to do in health? Oh, you're in healthcare, right? No. What, what are you in? MBA. Okay, so you want to do healthcare and management? Or? Yes, it is. So, what do you want? So, you want to just work in healthcare? Uh, no, I don't want to work in healthcare. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, you're just here to like sort of hang out and I'm just kidding. <laughs> what, do you, what do you want to do? Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear do you want to do healthcare management? No. How many people want to do healthcare management? Just Somebody out of curiosity. So you, this is basically just Manage, business? Management. Just management. So, I mean, if you can manage healthcare, you can manage a donut shop, a restaurant, you can manage anything. And, and that, let me tell you something. The best people that have gotten into healthcare are the people that were doing something else and went into healthcare to, because you come with a different vision. You come with a different idea, a different perspective. So I've noticed that people, even in, in medical school, the students that were really good in medical, medical school were not the ones that, when the day they were born, they wanted to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor. And then they go, to, they go to high school, they go to college, they go to medical school, they do residency, and then they go out and practice. The ones that like stopped along the way and was a car salesman and said, I, yeah, I want to be a doctor or the guy that was doing something totally different, when they come in, it's, they're different. And I've noticed that because I've been in medical education for, for many, many, many years. But the way technology, and let's say you want to do an MBA, right? And you want to, you want to, uh, you have a master's and you're running a software company. For sure, if you're running a software company or you're a coder and you're stacking and doing Python and you know, you're coding, you want to get into healthcare because it's huge. It's a huge market. So right now, your phone is powerful and it will become more powerful when it comes to healthcare. Right now, we're actually doing telemedicine through the phone. We were having this conversation, does an 80 year old know how to do it? My mom is 80 something and she knows how to do it. I you know, FaceTime with her but, all the but, time. But it's your mother. Yeah, no, but a lot of people do. There is a percentage that doesn't know how to do it, but as the population ages and they're using technology, technology is here to stay and we have to use it in the appropriate way. I know that you had a conversation about dehumanization mm -hmm. of technology and that's where it becomes sort of dicey when it comes to t touching the patient and listening to the heart. But I will tell you this, when I was uh, in my training in Delaware in the, in, in the 90s, there was actually a therapeutic glove or a, a glove that you would put on and the, you could actually feel the other person's, like the, that other person, of course, they would have to be in a place and they would have to be set up and you could actually examine their abdomen. Uh, right now with strokes, we're doing telemonitoring uh, um, and we're looking at a patient and saying, yeah, that patient has a stroke. So it's saving lives. It's saving a lot of lives. And I think that technology, artificial intelligence, so many different things that are happening uh, in technology and it's just exploding. I'm sorry? No, I was mentioning big data. Yeah, because information is important. I need, if, if I have 500 patients or 1,000 patients, I wanna know 
who hasn't gotten their vaccines? Like right now, when I went to my company, the first thing I said, how many people got the COVID vaccine? And they're like, well, you know, we're working on it. We have this company that's looking into it. We have to go into Florida shots, but everybody's like that because it's not like you have thousands of people. If you have a company that has thousands of employees, like for example, I don't know if you guys know here at the university, how many of the students have gotten it? You know, so it becomes, or how many of the staff have gotten vac vaccinated? So that information is really vital, and it sounds easy and a no-brainer, but it's hard to get. I want to show, to, to show them, this is, this is a, just a fact that I just took from the, from the internet. At this time, there are 350,000 health apps out there. And in last, uh, in from year 19, 2019 to 2020, there were two, 250 million downloads per day. People dealing with health. And the same happened with management, the same happened in, in, in every aspect of our lives. So technology is everywhere. And every day, I think that last year uh, it grew um, around 15% in the number of apps in the healthcare area. But you, but you know that now you, you can't even find a husband through internet with all the specs. <laughs> Rich, handsome, and with a couple of heart attacks, right? Okay, but there's a, there's, uh, a few threats in an area in technology area that have to be, you have to be aware of, even in healthcare or management or whatever. First one is the over-dependence on the crowd, over-dependence on the cloud, or connectivity issues. How many times do you have, uh, you're in the class and you have connectivity issues that, hey, l last night I was giving a, a talk and he said, I, I cannot hear you well because there, there's issues in the community. The same happened uh, when you're using technology. Security, hackers. At this time, hackers are the good ones because the crackers are the bad ones. So hackers in the beginning was the, the bad guys that get in and, 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 and steal your, your information, but now they're the good ones. And, this, and, and, the, and the situation of the human eyes of medicine that Dr. Suarez already talked about that. Doctors are, are part of the problem, sometimes, because they don't want to be, they, they want to touch the people, they, they want to do the clinical exam instead of doing it by, by telemedicine. They want, they want to be closer to the patient. The patient needs uh, the, 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 the doctor to be close to, him, to them. So, the system is, there's a lot of people that can't come in and, you know, my, my, uh, my son and my daughter, my, um, my son's like, dad, you know what, let's, let's come up with a company that we could, um, you know, just see people, this was a few years ago, just get an app and you download it and you just take care of people for like their skin problems. Skin is actually, you know, when, just looking at a rash is, is easier than, you know, doing an exam. Um, and I said, you know what, and that's like, why would you do that? You know, you wanna, you, he goes, cause it's easy and you're in your house and you could do it. So, you know, this, your generation expects that and, and, and you like that and it's convenience. It's like Uber Eats, you know, it's like Uber Doc. And um, um, there's a transition and it's gonna happen. It's happening now. And there is like an Uber doc that you just get on. And so maybe an older generation doesn't like that. They want to examine the patient. I remember when um, there was a push during the HIV epidemic that they said, listen, you got to put on gloves to examine patients. And there were people that were offended. Um, how, let me just out of curiosity, how many of you, when you go to the doctor, want them to examine you with gloves on? You don't care? Maybe you guys are old school. Huh? Sorry? When they start touching things without gloves, I realize like 
don't know. No, like if they examine you, do you want a doctor to wear the gloves? But let me tell you, so a study was done on a younger population, and they actually want their doctor to wear gloves. And if they don't wear gloves, they think it's not professional, it's not good. You get an older population, and it's, they, they feel that they're, that they're not humanistic, that they're putting it on because they think that that... So, I mean, we actually now, because of COVID and because of everything, we're putting on gloves. We're actually putting like hazmat suits on <laughs> to examine patients. But, um, but, you know, it's all cultural, I think. And I think it's the way we evolve as a society. Um, and there's always threat. There's always, there's always a gangster out there that wants to scam the system and, you know. There are people and, and, making a lot of money. And making a lot of money. I, I, in the, the I, information. I worked in a, with, a, with a hospital. And believe it or not, most hospitals in Miami, a lot of hospitals in Miami, have been under cyber attack and had to pay out. You know, we now get insurance for that. Uh, it's sad, but it's true. And they, they actually, they could paralyze your business. Because mm -hmm. right now, if your electronic medical record is down, you're done. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a tactic. Yeah. You're right. Every time, uh, I'm here five years ago, and every time that I have to go uh, in hospital or wherever, I'm telling that I have uh, a hospital or wherever, they didn't tell me since the beginning how much I need to pay, even though I request in advance to raise a big uh, uh, test. And never after that, when I receive the invoice, I know you're in I agree. Uh, I agree. Uh, that is called it's not a business. Su surprise billing. Yeah, surprise billing. So yeah, you know what happens? Billing. So what happens is, is that there needs to be trans. If it was a business, okay. When you go to the car dealer, are they going to tell you, listen, it's going to cost you this much? More or less, you know, right? And if before they change anything, they tell you, right? Right. They tell you. In medicine, it doesn't work like that. No, they uh. tried legislation recently to do right. that, and they they shot it down. Yeah, but no, now, now there has to be transparency in billing. Right, right now, hospitals have to put the prices in the internet, and you go in. And you're right, they should tell. Right, so copay. And I paid $7,000. No, that's not fair. So, wow. Let me. You had to pay that? I, I would give you this letter that I have, that I have a wow. template. I have a patient. This is a side thing. First of all, you know that Medicare won't pay for that $7,000. And that's where our system is so broken. Do you know that um, a patient got like a seventy dollars or $80,000 bill from a hospital? And I had read this book that would, there was... Um, uh, that explains healthcare, and it and it was a guy that had a friend who was a lawyer, and they put these lawyerly letters in there. That letter helped so much. I actually said to him, "You know what? Send them this letter to the hospital, and deny everything, and challenge them, and fight them." And you know what? They waived the bill. They said, no, you know what? We received your money from, from the insurance company and sorry. But they were going to, he was going to, he was going to, he was out. He, this poor guy, he was an elderly person. He was so scared, you know, because when you get a bill like that, it's devastating. It could crush your life, you know, and walked away. And that's why I believe medicine um, should not be regulated and it's not shouldn't be done that way because what happens is is that it leads to that and it's abusive I have a, I have a curiosity okay. I hear you saying that but I hear you saying that but that is counterintuitive because there is no regulation it gives the provider the license to charge and do anything they want if there was a framework on the other hand that is not necessarily draconian 
or anything near draconian, but it is suggested a particular uh, a, a, a structure, uh, a framing of prices, so to speak, then at least you have some sort of, there's a reference point, as opposed to you're simply walking into the, into the abyss, and you, the hospital that is, and you come away with, uh, with, 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 with bills that are just inexplicable. Okay, so uh, right, so I it can't, MRI. yeah, it can't be. It can't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna sum it up in two seconds, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna give you an example of what I did with this, with with this uh, other person that was amazing. Look, of course there has to be some rules, and of course there has to be some regulation. A few years ago. Um, one of a CEO of a person that owned a very big healthcare organization, um, I said, listen, why don't we create a clinic and create a membership where everybody, the way they would do it in other countries and the way Kaiser uh, Permanente started their business model years ago that then became an insurance company, um, and it all started because they, they were building ships and they didn't want their worker to go out to the hospital to a clinic. So they said, let's just do the clinic right here. So we created a membership program and people were paying $20 a month. And in that $20 a month, we would give, it, they, it was a discounted plan. So a CBC, and these were from people that had no insurance. So we, because there was a, uh, it was here in Miami and there were a lot of people coming from Colombia in the early 2000s. I mean, plane loads. I was seeing so many people without insurance, it's crazy. So what happened was is that for $20 a month, you would become a member. So if you needed an EKG, it was 20 bucks. If you uh, needed a CBC, it was $10. If you need, these are like lab tests. If you need to see a, then we would negotiate with, there were residents, and we say, listen, if you see a, special, a specialist, it was $40. And we would give the specialist most of the money, or it was $50 or $60. And it was a discounted plan. Do you know how many people joined? 15,000 people. 15,000 people, and we pay, and they pay $20 a month. Do the math. So it was millions of dollars that were coming in for the membership which paid for the entire staff, for the entire organization. People were so happy. They were paying a couple of hundred, they were paying $120 for primary care. So it was only for primary care. We tried to negotiate with some hospitals, but that was very difficult, but it was for primary care. Do you know what happened? The insurance companies got together and said, hey, these guys, they're acting like an insurance company. Mm -hmm. That's illegal. So we got to regulate those guys. You know what they did? They put us out of business. I, I was not an owner of that. I was like somebody that was part of it. Actually, it was started, I was a member of a Kiwanis club and it started through Kiwanis. But then it just morphed and then Kiwanis people left because it was not their vision. Because we started, we, had, we actually grew to about five or six clinics. And this discount plan, they regulated it they wanted for you to have a lot of millions of dollars in, in escrow, and they made it so difficult that it put all these people out of business. And what happened, those 15,000 patients, that a lot of them didn't even have a legal status in this country, okay? They lost out. They lost out. Right. And that is my, that is my experience with over-regulation. So and that's not over-regulation. That is your competition finding a way. Right. But the through, but that competition under the, went under to the, the government guise, under the guise of regulation. So mm -hmm. the government, yeah. So no, wait, 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 wait. The government, right? So the gov, they they went to I the say, government. I want you to put them out of business. Right, and, and that's what they did. How much I'm going to pay you? And they did that. And so they did he that. Pretends to be a regulator, or he has the influence or the appearance of a regulator. And he puts you out of business. So the but that was but they paid they paid they basically got mm -hmm. 
these lobbyists got the government to come up with this to destroy the whole system. Well, because the lobbyists influenced the right. representatives who are then in a position to make the laws that favor them in exchange for some vote on right. some other bill at some future point. I agree that there has to be some, if you were a physician and you, oh, uh, a provider, and you had to see how many hoops I have to go through to give adequate care and how much time I have to spend documenting, you would be like, oh my God, this is crazy. But, but so I spend 20 minutes with the computer so then Medicare could pay me, but I'd rather spend it with you asking you how's your family? How are your kids doing? And I just want to do done. But if I don't put down and put how sick you are and, and, and make sure that I, ha I cross everything out, so that's my experience with government. Look, this is complex. This is, this is very complex. This is a topic you know for, for four I, or five lectures more. I want you to, and you and every single person here to be good. I want you to be healthy. But you know what? There's somebody in the way between you and I. And, and I would love for these people to move out of the way and not destroy this relationship. And that's the problem. But listen, I think we're wrapping up. We're yeah, yes, wrap we're, it up. Oh, I just want to, to show this um, to them about management. Uh, Peter Drucker, probably uh, he's a, one of the gurus in, in management, uh, a well-known guy. He said, management is doing the right thing, the things right. Leadership is doing the right things. It's your decision whether you want to be a manager or you want to be a leader. It doesn't matter where you are, healthcare, politics, or whatever. Working for insurance companies that you can see that insurance companies is, are part of the problem in healthcare. I just... Uh, I just asked my, my, uh, the, the guys that I was lecturing last night, how many people does a health insurance company have saved? How many people? Zero. These guys are the ones that save lives. And you are the patients. So the relation has to be between you. And insurance companies are, have to be around, paying, looking, so you can, you can get together and, and, and receive the, the base um, health care. So with that in mind, Dr. Suarez, you want to, so just to, to wrap give the it final up, thought? Whether you, you're in management in health care, whether you're in management in restaurant business, in the food industry, in any industry, I think um, you bring yourself, uh, your personality, you are your tool in management. Um, you need to develop qualities that inspire people. You need to bring qualities of, of organization, know how to come up with a business plan, know how to come up with, you know, how to execute a, a plan. Um, you have to know how to make it happen. So it doesn't matter if you get into healthcare and it doesn't matter if you're in the food industry. It's all the same thing, more or less. Um, when it comes to healthcare, you know, you're dealing with lives. You know, you're dealing with people that are going to die, people that could live on decisions uh, that you may make. Uh, so, uh, do you guys have any questions? And I know, listen, we can go on for hours and hours. And hours, <laughs> and hours. So, so, but, so, but, and, 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 and I do want to tell you this. Never ever bring your politics, for example, Dade County Medical Association is not political. As a doctor, we, we don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. We really don't. We fight Democrats, we fight Republicans. It doesn't matter. Because we advocate for doctors and patients. That's what we advocate for, okay? And I hope nobody here ever thinks that, you know, we're giving political spiel because we're not. As a physician, you're never a politician. You never tell anybody what your feelings are about uh, uh, Republicans or Democrats. I am gonna tell you this. Um, sometimes I've dealt with politicians and I hope none of you have relatives that are politicians, but, but 
You know what? They're both about the same. They're all the same. I don't care if you're in the left and you're in the right. It's all about the same thing. It's all about power and BS. And the color is not red or blue. It's green. Exactly. Exactly. And another thing, that Dr. Suarez, is that remember that while you're working in management or you're working in technology, technology is going to help you. But Peter Drucker also said that the, techno the technology revolution, you start thinking as a binary, ones and zeros. But remember, when you deal with human beings, you always have to think in what happened if. That's the difference of technology, management, and dealing with people. The if. And, and if you think of this in management, you always think of the, a patient as a customer. So whatever, you, whatever field you get into, you're always there to advocate for the customer and for your employees. And I think that if you have that focus, you'll be successful. Okay, thank you. So, so first of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. Suarez, uh, and you, to be a little bit past the time, because I'm very respectful of the time, but I think we have an engaging conversation, so I really appreciate you being available. Thank you. I think that was a very enlightening, and, and as Angel said, there's a lot of lectures to cover all these topics, right? There's like a lot of things to talk about. Maybe we should set up some sessions that you can come over <laughs> and we'll see those things more regularly and we have more questions, Q&A sessions, something, something like this, right? But I wanted to thank everybody's presence. I want to thank our guests thank you. to be able to come here. It was really a pleasure to have you. And I, I wish to uh, continue our conversation from now on on these and future topics. And uh, if you guys... Uh, and, and if you have any questions, our office is in yes. ninth floor. If you have any questions or comments, send it to Angel, to me, uh, I'll forward to Dr. Suarez. We'll keep the conversation going. And again, thanks very much for your participation. It was a pleasure. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for All right. Thank you. Thank you.